I've been in situations where, like, my God, the phones are not ringing. It's like crickets out there. Hello. Hello, is anyone there? And I would do anything for Lee just because I have a hungry team ready to do work, very capable. We need opportunities. Our confidence is the low point, and I would pay for that. My former business coach, Kieran McLaren, always tell me, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Doing so, we went from winning only one out of five jobs to winning about 75% of the jobs that came in. It got to a point in which I was thinking, this game is too easy to play. Somebody gave me the cheat codes and I'm on like God mode where the bullets don't hurt you. You have unlimited power ups and I'm just doing this. And I got kind of, I hold my head. A little confident, a little cocky, maybe even arrogant. I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting out of bed unless it's a $600,000 job. The team can win the other ones. This question, Chris, comes to the pro group is, should I refer my leads to my competitors? Um, there's going to be moments in your life and your career when you're going to get projects and clients that are not a good fit for a number of different reasons. It could be from a scheduling point of view, a budget, a wrong product marketing mix. It's something. And what are you going to do with this work? And people are very reluctant to say, say no, because they are living in a scarcity mindset. But my best recommendation is to refer someone else in your network. You help somebody else out and you help this prospect and they'll remember you for it. Remember, whenever it is that we're in a sales state of mind, our highest priority is to serve the person in front of us, not to serve ourselves. So when they need help, you have to get into like, get out of sight of your own mindset and say, look, what do they need right now? They need a logo designer or they need somebody to help them with a marketing funnel and you don't currently offer those services. Instead of just saying, no, I can't help you, do a little bit of work. Find out what they want. Find somebody in your network and refer them. Do not refer anybody you don't like, that you don't trust or you don't believe in because that's going to do disservice to all three parties, to the designer vendor, to the client and yourself, because then you will, instead of building goodwill, you build negative goodwill. And if you wind up doing this a lot, you might want to establish a relationship with the people that you refer out and say, how much do you pay for new leads? And open it up that way and say, well, I have excess work that I cannot do. That's sometimes not a good fit for me, but might be a perfect fit for you. Do you want those leads? And can we have an agreement where the leads that I send you, you're going to pay me a finder's fee or a sales commission for introducing you to the client. These are pre-vetted clients who are ready to buy. If you ask most people, they would be thrilled to pay a percentage of the revenue that is generated for a good hot lead. This could be anywhere between 6 to 15%. I think somewhere in there feels pretty fair to me so that everybody can make some money and there's still some meat on the bone. But what about if you're going to be referring clients to someone else? Uh, I guess my fear is that wouldn't I be losing potential future business by giving my clients away to somebody else? What's the alternative, Drigo? You can't do the work. The assumption is if you could do the work, you're not thinking about referring, right? So you want to let the client just die on the vine and say, nope, I can't help you. I'm too busy. We're, no, of we're course service. not, but it's giving my clients away to somebody else. Um, you know, I feel like I could be hindering myself from potentially in the future working with that client again. Okay. You just really run through the scenario in your mind. One, you can say yes and take on the client and really stre- uh, stretch yourself so thin that you're going to do a poor job with the existing clients that you've promised and the new client that you're about to onboard. You're serving nobody in this way. And you're probably not building healthy relationships in your life by saying yes to everything. So your only real option is to say no. So by saying, no, I can't work with you, you A, create more demand for you in the future to say like, you know what? I'd love to work with you, but my schedule is full. I'm not able to take anybody on because it would compromise the work that I've already committed myself to. And that shows that you have integrity, you have standards, And you're willing to say no today for a yes tomorrow. And if you just leave it there, then that's fine. But that means that that client is going to go somewhere else anyways and find somebody that may or may not be a good fit for them, but you've earned no more goodwill. The best thing to do is to say, no, I can't do this. Tell me more about what you need. Perhaps somebody in my network can help you because if you're looking for a referral, I can do that. So now you're actually creating goodwill, but you're also helping someone else out. And that's also a good thing because those people are going to also owe you. 
And this is a wonderful thing. You get to help two people all because you don't want to be a jerk about this and live in a, a place of scarcity. Like, how should I find someone that would be a good fit as a referral partner for my business? Well, this is the Future Pro Group, right? We have several hundred people in here who are at least united by the, uh, my connection with them. I'm not saying that they're all great people and they all know how to run a business, but I would start in the pool of people that you know. And this is a great way to build a meaningful long-term relationship because the idea is when you're in a community, communities help each other. Uh, I'm constantly posting job leads that are not a good fit for me. Actually, all job leads are not a good fit for me because I don't do work for clients. And think about it. If you're the recipient to one of these leads that actually leads to real money in your pocket, don't you feel like you have a deeper connection to me? And you might feel like, wow, dang, uh, I'm making money just by being in this community. And this is a good thing. Because like I've said this many times before, people refer people that they know, like, and trust. So you start with a pool of people you already know. Now, if you want to take this to the next level, if you think of yourself as uh, a fluid agency, which means you're you're just a few people at the upper levels of management, but you don't have a ton of production resources in-house, it means you need to be able to have established relationships with a variety of people who basically create the services that you want. So you would be able to refer designers, developers, um, people who run content uh, marketing funnels, things of that nature, content writers. And you want to have a roster of people you vetted beforehand so that when the work comes in, you can bring them on as subcontractors or you can just refer the work out. Those are options for you. And the key to making this successful is not to wait for the demand to come and then to scramble to look for a solution. You want to be proactive and you want to be ready for these moments. I, my former business coach, Kieran McLaren, always tell me, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Is there more tactical tips or any uh, advice you can give someone reaching out to another business owner? Yeah. So here's, here's the big concept. Take a competitor out to lunch. Why would you take a competitor out to lunch and why would they even have lunch with you? I got to tell you something. This is an often overlooked strategy that people don't pay enough attention to because it seems weird. It seems counterintuitive that no one would agree to this. But there have been books that have been written about this. One of the books that, that is out there is called Never Eat Alone. Everybody has to eat. Everybody has to eat at least once a day, I think, unless you're, or you're fasting. But people have to eat lunch and they have to eat dinner. The easier of these two options is lunch because it's a low commitment. It's not too expensive. What you should do is you should reach out to the agencies and studios that are bigger than you. So if you're a four-person agency, contact a 20-person agency. If you're a 20-person agency, contact a 50-person agency. You understand the idea. And you can say, I've been an admirer of you. We work in the same space. I don't see us as competitors, but I would love to be able to take you out to lunch and, and pick your brain, right? Easy ass there. And you won't do this uh, and you'll tell yourself all kinds of reasons until one day you wake up and like, you know what, I'm just going to give this a try. You'll reach out to them and they'll be like, oh yeah, okay, we'll go to lunch. And you pick somewhere nice and you go and sit down and you say, thank you so much for doing this. Ask them a few questions. And the way that you want to approach this is after you've built some rapport, because this is a social call, you don't want to go straight in for the business, but you know, you can say something like this. I've been wondering if there's ever a situation where you get work that isn't a good fit or the timing or the client is a conflict of interest. And if you do, I would love to be able to take some of that off your plate and service your client. And if you send me any of this kind of work, I'd be happy to pay you a finder's fee. You let me know what works for you. And if it's fair, I'm happy to do this. And you would be surprised. First of all, now you've met a competitor that might one day be your mentor but now they have a solution and you've presented yourself and you've stood out from the rest of the people. You've made their life easier. And you don't, you don't have to show them work over the lunch table. You can say, I'll follow up with you. I'll send you a couple of relevant links that I think are appropriate. And, and during that conversation, you'll probably learn some things about where their pain points and challenges are. And then that way you can align the work that you send over. And if you think, you know what? Actually, what they need is not what I can do then you probably say, you know what, from the sounds of it from, from today, I appreciate you. I don't do any of that work. This is more of what I do. So it might not be a good fit. That's an opportunity for them to say, well, send it to me anyways. 
So you want to do this very permission-based marketing approach or sales approach where they're inviting you to share, not you just doing that spam approach. It's just like giving people solutions they don't want or have never asked for. So here's the thing. I've recently got an email or a direct message from someone saying, Chris, I didn't believe you. I didn't believe you. I resisted. I resisted. And finally, I took a competitor out to lunch and they said yes. And now I'm getting work from them. Surprise. Like what I say works if you apply it. Okay. The rest is up to you. Is there a number or a range of how much I should be expecting to pay as a referral or finder's fee? Yeah. I mentioned before, Drigo, it should be anywhere between six to 15%. When it gets beyond 15%, it becomes almost uh, untenable in terms of like your margins. For some people, they're so desperate for leads, they'd pay you 30 to 50%. It doesn't even matter. And you've been in a situation like this. I've been in situations like this. I'm not trying to get on a high horse and say like you little people or something. I've been in situations like, my God, the phones are not ringing. It's, It's like crickets out there. And I would do anything for a lead just because I have a hungry team ready to do work, very capable. We need opportunities. Our confidence is the low point, And I would pay for that. Uh, that would mean that you would be buying the project, meaning there'd probably be no profit for you, but it's at least something for your portfolio, for the experience, and just a boost of like, hey, we're, we're not dead yet. We, we still got uh, a little pulse going on here. Awesome. Thanks for that. The next question from the pro group is, what should I look for in a good communications coach? I have been the beneficiary of having a few really important and effective mentors and coaches in my life. Not a ton, but just enough so that I've been able to get unstuck in the most critical moments of my life. For many people, they're looking for the perfect coach or mentor to work with. And I just tell you right now, the alternative is to do nothing, to sit in your pain for another three, six, nine months and see what happens. So oftentimes, perfect can be the enemy of good. And good is the result that we're looking for. So you're going to reach out to people in your network and say, hey, do you work with a coach? Do you have a mentor that you work with that you can recommend? Just reach out to your friends and family network and just start there because they're not going to steer you wrong. Be a little wary of coaches that are on stages talking about how great they are as part of their sales funnel because their business is to bring in more clients. And sometimes they can be credible, but I'm always a little leery of those types of coaches. Just go with the friends and family network and ask around if somebody's had a positive experience. And then here's what I would do. Schedule a call with them and get a feel for their coaching style. And don't be afraid to tell them, here's how I like to be coached. Is this your style? Are we a good fit for each other? And depending on how they answer, you have a feel for it and trust your gut. Because at this point, it's really about feeling like style and communication are important things to see if you're going to mesh well together. Don't worry so much if they have specific industry experience. This is a classic mistake. If you are a restaurateur you're, and you do Italian food, you're going to look for a coach who's coached other restaurateurs who do Italian food. First of all, it's very hard to find them. And I'm not quite sure what you're looking for. Are you looking for cookie cutter, uh, me too solutions? Is that what you're looking for? Are you looking for a person who understands the larger aspect of business, marketing, sales, customer relationships? When I hired my business coach, I'm going to tell you the story and then I'll I'll wrap this part up. Here's the first part. Number one is I was having lunch with a friend of mine and he talked about how his business was booming and I was super curious. I'm like, what did you do differently? Well, we hired a business coach and it was the first time I actually heard that term business coach. Okay, so forgive me for like living under a rock. So I immediately asked for the referral. I called this business coach. I met with this business coach. And first of all, he looked nothing like what I thought a business coach was was going to look like. So this is an important lesson of not judging a book by its cover. I'm living in Los Angeles. Specifically, I'm living in Venice. I expected somebody to come in with a business suit, you know, uh, maybe casual or just business attire. Somebody that you would see on on. TNT or something where you're like, whoa, okay. Like sharp hair, like a Hollywood agent comes in. It's like super sharp, pressed shirt, a middle-aged person. Nope, not at all. Well, who walked in? A, a large overweight man who looked like Santa Claus. And that was my coach for 13 plus years. His name is Kier McLaren. He comes in a little jovial and just a big hearty laugh wearing jeans and a t-shirt. 
rode in on his motorcycle. I'm like, okay. And we talked. And he did not, at that point in time, have any clients that worked in the design or the motion design space. He had people that were musicians, camera rental companies, something, you know, creative, abstract in the larger sense, but no specific experience. But what he did was he asked me a series of really simple questions and gave me clarity and insight immediately. This was our initial meeting. No money had exchanged hands. And I knew this was going to be my coach for a long time because he saved me from a disastrous business decision. Later on, I would find out, he would say, you know, every one of you guys, meaning people in the creative space, think you're so unique and different, but I hate to break it to you. You're not. You're in the business of sales and marketing and customer service. It just so happens that you do design. And he really helped me to understand that because we think, oh my gosh, well, I'm an underwater basket weaver. No one could possibly understand that. But what are you without clients? What are you without marketing and sales? And if you're able to sell through and you suck at customer service, it's not going to take too long before you run out of clients to sell to. So we're all really in the same business. It's someone who understands business, understands people, communications, and what, what levers to pull. They'll be able to help you. So please don't get hung up on if they have extremely relevant industry experience. It's more about communication style. It's more about coaching style. That's what you're looking for. Now, I just want to let you know, I look for very specific types of people in my life that I'm going to take advice from. And I tell them, I like direct, clear communication. I don't want to dance around this issue. And if you work in that way, we're going to get along just fine. I say to them, I have relatively thick skin. I prefer you to give it to me straight, doctor, as they say. I don't want to like meander through like, well, how does this feel? And for you to be tiptoeing on and walking on eggshells. I don't want that. Just tell it to me straight. So my therapist, Joan Lightfoot, my former business coach, Kier McLaren, they were super straight. And I learned so much from both of them. And you might say like, has that influenced my own personal communication style? Maybe, maybe this is a chicken and egg thing. Maybe this is how I communicate and I find the right people and we amplify each other. Or maybe I was on the cusp of something and because I can see their communication style that I learn from that and I start to emulate them. Who knows? So you're a coach by here for 13 years. What would you say was the best advice that he gave you? He told me, say what you think. And it sounds super simple and basic. Like, what do you mean say what you think? Don't we all say what we think? Turns out we don't. We're so fearful of finding the right words, the tonality, and to be able to stay, state it in a way that matches our intention. And we're so fearful of the client's reaction to all of this that we oftentimes cannot say what it is that we think. And this creates a lot of stress in us. Like we want to know what the budget is, but we don't ask. We think the terms are unfair, but we don't say. They're using abstract language and we think we know what they're saying, but we don't ask because we don't want to seem stupid or dumb. And so early on, Kier looked at some of my sales calls. He would say, tell me how you do a sales call from beginning to end. And he was a little shocked and amused, I think. And he said, how, how do you know what they want? You never ask what they want. And I thought you can never ask for what it is that you want because that would mean that you're out of touch with what's going on, that I thought you were supposed to be leading the conversation. Now, keep in mind, I was working as a director uh, talking to advertising agencies about commercial campaigns. And so I always thought they're looking for me for a perspective, a way to shoot, the way to edit or to color grade or a visual effects trick. And that's how I'd seen this done before from directors that I had looked up to. And so I was behaving like them. But I find that it's just much easier to say, when you were writing this concept, what inspired you? What is it about this campaign that is like every other campaign that you've worked on or is totally different? Can you be super specific? When you say it needs to be cinematic, can you give me some reference points so I can get into your mind? Um, when you say you know, there's, there's no budget limitations, the best work will win, do you mean that literally any budget will work? So if I came back with a million dollar budget, you could get this approved? So he just gave me permission to say what it is I was thinking. And I thought, this is too simple. This is too basic and maybe too crass. Like I'm some uneducated cretin who is a production monkey. 
And it turns out asking these questions garners a very interesting response, as you can imagine. Oftentimes people are thrown for a loop and they sit back and they're like, wait, these are some of the best questions that anybody's ever asked me. And you're asking me to go into my own mind to explain to you what I was thinking. Some people say it's quite uncomfortable to do this. And over time, I would tell them before we even got deep into the conversation, do you have 45 minutes, an hour to talk to us about your project? Because it's going to take that much because I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that might get uncomfortable for you. But we find that when we spend this kind of time to learn about what our clients want and think and expect and are afraid of, we come up with much better solutions that are meaningful to you. And that's important to me. And in doing so, we started to see our win rate go up by a lot. So prior to that point in time, it was very difficult for us to win jobs who are $250,000 and above. And that might sound like a lot to you, but to make a commercial back in the day, that's actually a relatively small budget. Doing so, we went from winning only one out of five jobs to winning about 75% of the jobs that came in. It got to a point in which I was thinking, this game is too easy to play. Somebody gave me the cheat codes and I'm on like God mode where the bullets don't hurt you. You have unlimited power-ups and I'm just doing this. And I got kind of, I'll admit, a little confident, a little cocky, maybe even arrogant. I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting out of bed unless it's a $600,000 job. The team can win the other ones. It just became so easy. So if you're like, where does Chris get his confidence from? Well, where I get my confidence is from is from nailing half a million dollar jobs left and right, feeling like a walk on water. And you learn these skills and it's a communication skill. It's about listening and asking and being curious. And that's a super powerful thing. Something that no one ever taught me, Someone, something no one ever talked about in school or even understood. And this is coming from a relatively old man. He could be my father telling me, all you have to do is say what it is that you think, to be courageous enough to speak your mind. Then the rest of it is finding the, the, the terminology, the cadence, the flow, to be able to say it so to, and say it with a smile, the speaking smile, if you will, so that clients don't feel like put off. And, and that takes a little bit of practice, but it's not an impossible skill to acquire. That was tip number one. With the say what you think, do you apply this to other parts of your life as well? Yes. If it if you think about this, this is a human to human relationship. It's a communication dynamic. And I often will refer this as an example when people are confused. Like when your friends ask you for something that puts you on, uh, into a, like um, a state of discomfort, like you're like, why are you asking me for these things? And we don't have clear boundaries with people. And we feel like, gosh, if I say no, I'm just going to be the worst human being in the world. And sometimes you just have to learn to say no because it actually protects you and your relationships. Um, Brene Brown said this, and I, I think it's wonderful what she said. She said, choose discomfort over resentment. It's better for you to be clear and to live in a state of discomfort than to say or go along with something and feel super resentful to the person afterwards. This damages your relationships. And this happens all the time. If you think about it, when somebody's a really good salesperson, they're able to convince you to say yes, and they use a lot of social cues and dynamics to trigger you to say yes. And you can't say no, so you're like, okay, I'll just say yes. But later on, you walk away feeling cheated, and you're going to be very resentful to this person, and you're going to beat yourself up, and you're going to say, like, why didn't I have a backbone? Why didn't I do this? And instead of taking it on the chin, you're going to externalize that negative emotion, and you're going to project it to, to that person. They did what they needed to do, which was to get you to say yes. Well, maybe they weren't super 100% ethical about it, but you had free will. You just couldn't say no. And so then you choose to now dislike this person. So there's a lesson to be learned here that the stress that you're feeling does not come from the things you say. It comes from the things you do not say. You could just walk away and say, this is not a good fit for me and just walk away. Otherwise, you'll wind up beating yourself up and disliking people. And this could really create long-term harm in your personal and professional relationships. Here's tip number two, and it's about really um, managing your relationships with the people who work for you. And, and this is going to be a theme that might lead into my next tip, but here we go. When people work for you, you, you do not realize the power you have as the owner, as the director or the creative director. So people want to please you. They don't want to tell you the truth and they just want to see you happy. It's innate and it's probably why you hired them in the first place, right? 
And so oftentimes we were finding that I was getting frustrated or disappointed in the work product that I was getting from the team, either freelancers or staff. They were either missing deadlines or they were not doing what it is that I thought they were supposed to be doing. So I talked to Kier about this and he's like, you know, you need to give people permission to say no to you. By default, they will not say no. They will nod as if they agree, as if it can be done. And they already know that it cannot be done. So he says, do this next time you talk to one of your employees or staff. When you tell them what you want, like, I want to have three ideas done by Tuesday night. And then here's the thing. He's like, you have to add this part. Is this something that you can do? And it's okay for you to say no. And I need to hear that now so that I'm not disappointed later. If there's some part of this is confusing or there's too much here for you to do, let's have a conversation about it. And then we'll figure out what we can do. And so here's the funny thing. I try this thinking they're not going to tell me anything. But in fact, what he said is true. So I'm talking to designer and he said, Chris, everything makes sense. I totally can do this. Here's my problem. I've been given two other priorities in air quotes. Which one is more important? Which is a greater priority? I'm like, oh my God, I even know you had these two other things. Who, who the heck's telling you to do these things? And clearly in my mind, my thing is more important. I'm the boss. And now they're like stressed out. So they said, I'm going to go talk to your manager who assigned these two other things. I'm going to make that go away. And if I could do that, can you deliver this? Because now that's the expectation. And please do not come to me hours before the deadline say I can't do it, okay? If you can't do it for whatever reason, you need to tell me in an appropriate amount of time at the halfway point that you need additional help and you got stuck somewhere so I can find the right resources. But what's not acceptable is not doing what I asked by that deadline. Are we clear? They're clear. And that was a pretty big unlock. You have to give people permission to say no to you in a way that they can hear and you have to check in. Like, do we understand each other? Otherwise, what people do is just keep agreeing with you and you're going to be disappointed time and time again. It sounds like uh, setting expectations just across your business is, I think, with your clients, but then also with your employees. Because, you know, sometimes you get requests from clients that you're just like, well, can we even do this? But setting that expectations up front, it just, um, it's going to save you a lot of trouble. Yeah. Well, before I get into my next tip, let me add a different spin on this. We've been talking about it from the point of view of the, the owner or the manager. But what if you're the other person? I mean, even though you own your own business, you still have a client. Everybody has a boss, as they say, right? So what if your clients come to you and say, hey, we need this and this done by this date. And you're feeling like, oh, I can't do that. So you can understand now. You're like, whoa. And we just agree. We go along with this. So now you can understand how that feels from an employee or subordinate point of view, because now you're the employee or the subordinate to your clients. And so you also need to, even though they're not expert communicators, you can raise your hand and you can say, oh, okay, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Client, I heard what it is you want. And I'm having a hard time reconciling this in my mind because A, this goes way out of scope or B, this is way more work than it can be done. I need to figure out with you right now what the nice to have ours and the have to haves are because we need to prioritize that. I don't want you to be disappointed come Tuesday at 4 p.m. and we're not able to give you the quality of, the, of work that you're expecting from us and that we know we're capable of doing. So what you want to do is you want to raise the problem. You want to raise the problem up front as early as possible because the longer it takes to raise the problem, the more expensive it comes to solve. So if we see the problem, we have to say the problem, we have to be able to talk about it, we have to have enough courage and conviction to be able to say it and to, to be a mature business owner and say, I don't know how to do this in a time in which you've allotted or with the resources that we currently have. We need to have a conversation about this. Now, imagine if your employee or your staff or team member said this to you right up front when you said, I need X, Y, and Z done by this date. And they're like, whoa, whoa hold on. What you're saying requires four people to be able to do. And I'm one person. I need help in figuring out how you expect us to do this or me to do it and what kind of resources are available. Or maybe it was just a wish list and really the only thing you want done is this. Let's have a conversation about it. What happens to you as a manager, as an owner, as a boss, when somebody says that? Well, my gosh, you just rise in esteem. You're like, whoa, this is a real go-getter. This is leadership material here. The person was able to bring this up. You respect them more. So the thing that I'd like to share with everyone is 
this concept a friend taught me many, many years ago. It's called the symmetry of logic. Like if it works for a boss, does it work for an employee? If it works for an employee, does it work for a boss? Because oftentimes you are both the boss and the employee. If you look at it from both perspectives and you're consistent both directions and you know at least you're good. Because you're like, well, employee would never say that. Well, have you ever said that? Yes, I have said it to my clients. Well, you see how it works that way? So symmetry of logic, it should be both or it should be the same on both sides. Speaking of communicating with your clients and your employees, how would you suggest having conversations like this? I just gave you an example, but is there any specific situation you're looking for, Drigo? Yeah, um, I guess what I was trying to get from you was, you know, having these talks is like how you mentioned about like having tough conversations to pick up the phone call versus doing something like that in email so you can actually read or get a response from somebody. I think a lot of people get scared of just like, I'm going to send out this quick email or a text message and, and things sometimes aren't as clear because maybe you're not a good communicator, but also maybe because the client doesn't understand the lingo that we use. Yeah. Okay. Sending an email or a text message is uh, the equivalent to breaking up with someone via email or text message. You lack courage. You lack cojones. You lack whatever. And you're afraid. And so what you want to do is you want to send off a, a, a message or something that you don't have enough courage to say out loud. And, and you're not that good of a writer to be able to do this via email or text. And that's what you're doing. And what email and text can never do is to communicate tone, communicate the anxiety, awkwardness, or excitement somebody might feel when they say those exact words. And we do this in communication exercises, right? Communication exercise would be to say something like, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? So I just said it three ways that would resonate differently with a person just by the tone, intonation, and pacing. But when you type it on a screen, the tone and intonation is really dependent on the person's state of mind who's reading it. So if they're having a bad day, they're going to read that like, what? Screw you. Or, oh my gosh, I'm glad somebody cares. Like, what, are, what am I thinking? Let me tell you what I'm thinking. And so it can be very different. So I'm going to tell you, whenever it comes to co conflict resolution or bringing up tough issues, get on the phone. Get on the phone, get in front of your client, and have a conversation with them. Because not only do you get to hear their feeling in the words that they say, but you can also look at their face and their body language and their micro expressions. And you're going to be able to see like, oh, the words don't, don't match the body and the mind and the heart. So when you see that, you should also pause. Like, I'm getting a sense that some part of this isn't hitting you right. Tell me more about what you're feeling right now. Or it seems like you're uncomfortable with this. Can you express what you're thinking? And this is important for you to be able to address right then and there. So anytime there's a conflict, pick up the phone, have a five-minute conversation you'll get way more information and you're going to build a stronger relationship with your client. Yes, that uh, ties into tip number one, to say what you think. Yeah, they're all going to be the same, more or less. So here we go. The last tip, the last tip is this, is I talked a little bit about the power of being an owner. And when Kier used those words with me in the beginning, I'm like a power of the owner. It's like two words that's like making me feel really uncomfortable. I don't want to have power. I'm not trying to be powerful and I'm not trying to beat my chest. And it's like, well, me owner, you employee. And it just seems wrong. But the next lesson he taught me was do not underestimate the power of being an owner. And he said that I see you hiding in your office, afraid to talk to clients. And what you're doing is you're robbing them of an experience that only you can bring. And he would say this, and he's like, imagine that you're going to a restaurant or a cafe and you sit down and you're having a really nice meal and it's you and your wife and you're just enjoying everything. And then somebody comes out from the back, it's the owner or the executive chef, he introduces himself, he, he, he bends over, he's got his uh, apron on, he, he shakes his hand, he's like, um, 
I don't know if you know this, but I'm the executive chef. My name is Jean-Philippe. I was wondering how your meal was. You ordered the lamb, you ordered the salmon. Was it cooked to your to your liking? And you, of course, you're like, oh my God, the chef, the owner's here checking in on me? Like, who am I today that this has happened? And no matter what, you're going to say, this is a lovely meal. This is incredible. Thank you very much. And you're going to walk away feeling really important and looked after, and you're going to have an emotional connection to that establishment. In all my years of dining, it might have it might have happened one time when somebody came out and asked me this. I'm like, damn, I'm feeling really important today. This is feeling really good. Only one time. I'm 51 years old, okay? I've eaten out a lot. So he's like, now take that into the context of your business. And your team is working with the clients. And they come in, you have a spread, you, you, you've you got the welcome sign. Everything is great. But where are you in this picture? And I was telling him, Kier, I, I, I can't do this. I don't really want to have conversations with people. He said, what's wrong? I said, I don't know how to begin the conversation. And worse, I don't know how to get out of them. So what he did was he's like, uh, staff, come around. They're all gathered around my executive team. They're Chris. He needs to be in front of the client. It's critical for this company to build that kind of relationship because they're going to feel like he cares and it's important for us to get referral work and to continue, continue to grow this company. He doesn't know how to have a conversation with people. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to introduce him. And a couple of minutes later, I just want you to make up a reason and get him out of the room. So they bring me into the room next time the client was there. He, he, they would introduce me. It's like, oh, everybody, I just want you to meet Chris. He's the founder and owner of the company. Um, he, he just wants to check in on you. I'm like, hi, everybody. Uh, are we taking good care of you? You know, doing the same bit. Like, I've been looking at the work and I hope it's to your liking. This, you know, the same analogy here. And then my executive producer is like, you know what? I hate to do this, but I have to steal him away. He has to prep for another call. And I'm like, guys, I'm so sorry. If there's anything you need, please let me know and pull me out. And then they felt that same thing that I've only felt once in my life, that the owner cares. So over time, I was able to develop this into a skill, believe it or not. I know you guys are all laughing at me right now, that I can actually walk in myself and introduce myself and you say, okay, everything's great. I'm probably actually disturbing the workflow right now. So I'll get out of your hair and let me know if you need anything. I just walk out. And so I acquired a life skill, but... I also learned a big life lesson, which is at the end of the day, they can get anybody to do the work. But very few people actually care enough to communicate to them that their business is important and we don't take it for granted. And again, these are all communication skills, I think. Communication skills with your client, with your team, uh, both up and down the food chain, if you will. And then being able to be present and walk into a room and to look people in the eye and to be able to say, I care about you. Outside of the work, I care. If there's anything I can do, let me know. Here's the funny thing. Years ago, when I just was starting out, I literally was the messenger, the delivery boy for our own work. And so when the client said, we need you to go uh, pick up something, I didn't send a messenger. I literally went out there. And I went to this place called Rock Paper Scissor. It's a famous editorial company. It's run by a guy named Angus Wall. I didn't know it at the time, but I walk in. It's a beautiful as beautiful space as you can imagine. Creative spaces in the 90s. They had more money and it was just brilliant, big, open, beautiful space. I walk in there and I sit down and this lady walks over and barefoot, a little kind of hippie, but kind of Hollywood, LA hip, you know, walks over to me. It's like, honey, do you need anything? I said, no. And she goes, what are you here for? I said, I'm waiting for a tape so that I can uh, work on something. She goes, okay, well, if you need a coffee, a sandwich or anything, let me know, I'll take care of you. This was the executive producer who was a second in command at this company. For all intents and purposes, she ran the company. Angus was the talent. And if you're like, how do I know this name, Angus Wall and Rock, Paper, Scissor? Angus, I believe, has cut a bunch of David Fincher films and has worked with Fincher for many years as a commercial director, as a music video director, and then into cinema. So these are big, important people. And I'm just some young, dumb kid who, for all she knew, I was just a messenger because that's how I presented myself. And she showed that she cared. And I didn't even realize it back then. And then I'm like, those two moments come together. I'm like, oh, that's what they're talking about. I get it now. Awesome story. 
Uh, since we're talking about the past and we're taking it back, what was Chris Doe doing before he was closing 500 K thousand dollar projects? Like what made you want to find coaching? Okay. I, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but we were having a couple of good financial years. I think we were, we had two years where we did 2 million plus 2.2 $2 million dollars. And back then I had very little overhead. So most of it was profit. I would say we were probably running at 80% gross profit margins. So I'm not saying that's a net, but our expenses were so low. I was working out of my home in Venice and I had a bunch of these young people literally in my house set up in my living room with, with desks and computers. And we we're just, just living large. It was awesome. And I remember telling my wife that this year I want to hire coaches and just upgrade everything that we had. So we we transitioned from our accountant to a CPA. We brought on our attorney. We brought on a financial advisor and we brought on a business coach. And so this is something that people don't understand. It takes money to make money. And we had money. What we didn't want to do was just go throw it in the bank because that money wasn't going to do anything for us. So this is where we upgraded everything. So I learned a lot by working with our CPA, the first CPA we were able to work with. We've worked with many since. The attorney that helped us out and just formalizing a lot of what we did. The the financial planner who started helping us move our money around so we're minimizing our tax obligation. But the most important person was the business coach who helped me to grow way, way, way beyond. Here's the, here's the interesting thing to take note of. My cousin started working with me relatively early into my my business. He had just graduated, we're the same age. And I said to him, you know what? What are you doing? I just started a business. You want to come and hang out? I don't know if I have work, but maybe hang out with me. You can just live with me rent free. He goes, cool. And he started working with me. A couple of years into my coaching, I would have a staff meeting and I would speak to the team and everything. And he looked at me funny. And after the staff meeting was over, and I was like, Yo, why are you giving me that look? He goes, you've changed. And I can see it. It's so clear to me now. I said, what do you mean I've changed? He goes, well, the way you speak, the confidence, how you carry yourself and the way that you organize your mind, totally different. And he wasn't saying that as a dig. He was saying that in admiration, like, wow, you put in the work and you can actually transform. And he could see it. And this is a person who's known me most of my life. We've known each other since I was five years old. That's the power of coaching. Way, way back when I first started my business, I was like everybody else. I was floundering as an entrepreneur without the resources, without the business acumen, and without the confidence. And I was lucky enough to be in a place where there were plenty of opportunities. And I felt like my talent was good enough, but my marketing business and pricing and sales skills were zero. Like, like many creative people, I thought if the work is good enough, you never have to actually sell anything. Boy, is that a dumb idea. So I'm put into situations where I'm bidding on projects with global brands, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies like Nissan, Sun Microsystems, Janus Funds. Companies had made billions of dollars. And here I am as a 23, 24-year-old kid, fresh out of school, bidding on projects and not knowing what it is I was doing. And it was heartbreaking. It was just devastating to me to be able to be considered for these really big prestigious jobs, which were high profile and time and time again, step up to the plate and just swing and strike out every single time. And it was just like emotion, like very hard to handle because I'm like, I know I'm doing a terrible job on these conference calls. I think my work is good enough, but it's just, I'm missing something here. So I get into a solutions mode. I start to call up people that I know. I called up some of my friends who were directors who had graduated before me thinking, what is it that you know that I don't know? How are you getting work? And I got some of the worst advice ever. Advice like just lead the call, take control. They're looking for answers. I'm like, okay. And I tried that. I knew in my heart that was not the answer, but that's what they told me. And then I started to do the unthinkable. I called up my competitors and asked them, hey, um, you don't know me, but we're in the same space. And I was wondering if I could chat with you about a couple of business concepts. And I just want to know how you win your clients because we're having a really hard time. They either laughed 
or they gave they gave me the weirdest response and hung up the phone. I'm like, okay, this sucks, man. So I'm going to be stuck in this loop. It's a catch-22 thing where people won't hire me because I don't have experience doing something. But to get experience doing something, I need to be hired. Super frustrating. So we're just scraping by. And it was the toughest uh, two years in business. And everybody knows this. Your first two years are probably going to be the roughest in your life. I'm not ready to give up. Now, luck or fate would have it that I would run into producers who knew how to bid projects. And something as simple as bidding a project was back then super complicated in my mind, something that had a lot of mystery around it, and it was a lot of guesswork. So the first producer who came in, bid the project. I didn't win it, but I started to see how they started to work. And one of my friends from school referred me to the former executive producer at E! Entertainment Television. Her name is Karen Rainey. Karen, wherever you are, thank you so much for helping me out. She came into my office, bid the project, asked me like how how I'm going to do it, mapped it on the calendar, created milestones, figured out the resources that I need, and put together a five-page spreadsheet via Excel to formalize the bid. It looks super professional. And the beautiful thing is she did the exact same thing that the previous producer did, except she gave me the file. She goes, if you need anything else, let me know. And I didn't win that project either. But now my brain can go into the Excel spreadsheet and see things, how things were bid. And it was an eye-opening thing. And I started to change the formulas. I started to craft it. And over time, refine this thing to perfection. And we used this way of bidding for years afterwards. And it allowed us to be much more confident in our bidding. The reason why I created the pro group, the reason why was because Back then when I was struggling so desperately to make it, knowing that I had the talent but lacked critical business skills and know-how, that if someone were just generous enough to show me how to do it, it would have changed my life. So I would go on for many years just working out on my own, figuring things out as I go, making tons of mistakes. But the thing that allowed me to survive and thrive in those early days was I had a, a, like a crazy amount of opportunities just presented to me because of the skill that I had, motion design, in the city in which I lived in, Los Angeles, and the industry that worked in commercials and production, there were so many opportunities and so few people to do it. That allowed me to make lots of mistakes and learn up until the point in which I find my business mentor about four or five years into business. And then being able to hire him changed my, my world. Now, keep in mind, everybody, I started my business in 1995. 1995. Okay. Cell phones were very uncommon and expensive. The internet was just a thing. It just became a thing in like 1994. I had to literally ask my brother, what is the internet? It's like, Morpheus, what is the internet? And he had to tell me, this is pre-social media, pre-Facebook, pre-Google. These resources were not available. And I know this in my heart. It can feel very lonely, isolated to be an entrepreneur. Who do you turn to when you're not sure you're making the right decisions, if you're being fair or if you're being generous or too generous, because there's such a thing where you pay yourself last and you eat last and everyone eats but you. So I can turn to my wife, my business partner. I can turn to a couple of knucklehead friends and ask them, like, what's going on? What would you advise? And they would just give me uninformed opinions based on nothing more than gut feeling. And God bless them, love them. And I know they, they care about me, but this is not the kind of advice that I need. What I needed to hear was, what I needed to hear from was other business owners who were going through similar things or to have a coach who could see above all of that. So years ago, I created the solution that I wanted for myself so desperately, a place where you can go to get information and resources to be coached by someone who's been in business much longer than you, who has seen many battles on the field and can share those experiences. But I realized something is that where I'm at and where someone else is at <clears throat> is at such different levels that even though I think the advice is very sound, they cannot see it for themselves. Like, well, I don't have those same accolades. I don't have the same social proof. My bank account isn't as flush, so I cannot say what it is that you say. Sad as it is for me to admit, there's truth in this, in that we want to learn from someone who's slightly ahead of where we are or where we're going to be. Because then that information feels very relevant. It feels very doable. And 
it's going to make me feel like I can take on the world. So the Pro Group was born because it is an international, diverse collection of like-minded individuals and entrepreneurs who are a little bit behind you or a little bit ahead of you. And if you believe Jim Rohn in his expression saying that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, this is kind of critical. And I see this. If you spend time all day with children, your, your brain, the way that you speak, the way you think is at a different level. Not to say smarter or dumber, but you're looking to protect children, which is a different mindset. But when you're around people who are just in the streets, trying to make their name, dealing with marketing, sales, tough clients, bad clients, good clients, your business acumen is going to rise. Your business IQ will go up. It's the law of averages. And that's what I want to create here in the Future Pro community. Because I want you to have a better business IQ and to be around people who are going through what you're going through, to find community, to find connection, to feel safe, and to be able to share. Uh, Jim Quick says this too. He says, the best student is also the best teacher, and the best teacher is also the best student. And so we think when we join a community, we want to be a student, and people are just going to feed us information. We're going to grow. But as it turns out, if you just turn around and look at the person who's slightly behind you and you help them, not only do you help them, you help yourself because you gain clarity through articulation, David C. Baker. By helping them, you fortify what it is that you think you know. And this is how I became a much clearer thinker, much more level-headed, and a faster processor of creativity and information because for 15 years, I taught. And that first year in which I taught, I learned so much about myself and the way I think. I grew in confidence in an unshakable way. And it was all through teaching. So we hope that if you're considering joining the Future Pro Group, that you're going to come in it with the learner's mindset, but also with the teacher's spirit of generosity. If you can do both, you're an ideal person for this community. And I hope to see you in there. When people come up to me in the streets or in the pro group, and they ask me this question, Chris, you've done so much for me. What can I do for you? My response always is, and if you come up to me, I'll say the same thing like a robot. I'll say, you winning is the biggest thing that you can do for me. Because I'm not doing this for my health. I'm doing it because I want to see if I can help people. And you achieving your goals, blasting past milestones, unlocking parts of your mind, crushing your limiting beliefs is the, the fuel for my fire. Because it means that what I'm saying, what I'm doing, what I'm teaching is actually effective. I don't want to just stand here and talk to people and have no results. So when I see inside the community, when people DM me or they're sharing with each other how much they've been impacted by being a part of this community or having this unlock, that is all the reward. All, that's all the things that I need. And so it happens quite often. I start to become a little numb to it, but people continue to post their wins and, and they post it on the brag board. I love seeing those things. and I love people like recording their first podcast ever or reaching 100,000 followers on a social media platform where they thought they could never get past 10,000. That is the spice of life for me. And so I hope that with all the resources that we provide, the office hours, the group coaching that I provide personally, the curated content that I write specifically address the pain points and challenges that I'm feeling inside the group, the AMAs, all that stuff is designed to help you grow. And those are the resources I wish I had. What do you think is a skill that everyone should be learning right now? There are three critical skills you need to have in the 21st century, regardless of what it is that you do. You need to be a critical thinker to be able to digest, consume information, to compare and contrast and do some topical reading so that you can have an informed opinion. This is super critical. There's an abundance of information, conflicting ideas from supposed quote unquote experts, but you need to figure out after you're able to compare and contrast to figure out what your truth is, and that's important. A uh, Number two is you need to learn how to learn. Today, especially aided by artificial intelligence, the ability to ask the right question is more important than ever because you, as the thinker, critical human, uh, as a critical thinking human, have to learn how to articulate what you want via questions or queries or prompts. 
in being able to do so will allow you to learn even more. And every time I think I've like hit some kind of plateau on this, somebody will share with me what they're doing with AI or how they're structuring their workshop. And my mind is blown. I'm like, you know what? I'm still a kid in this game, still learning, and people are still out hustling me. And I love that. I'm I'm challenged and I'm inspired because it means that this game of learning is infinite. It's not finite. You don't hit a ceiling. You just hit a, a plateau that's the base of a new mountain. And I love that. So learning how to learn, how to unlearn, and to relearn is a critical 21st century skill. And the last one is your ability to articulate your thinking through writing, through poetry, through music, through interpretive dance, through visuals, through storytelling. Uh, you need to be able to learn how to be a persuasive speaker. Now, back in ancient Roman Greek, rhetoric was a critical subject like math. Something happened over the last couple hundred years or thousand years where we've lost rhetoric as a key skill. Rhetoric means art and philosophy or the theory of persuasive speaking. This is very important. As you can see, back in the days of the Senate or Socrates or Plato, the ability to speak, command attention and to move people was the skill that people looked at as one of the most important skills to have. You need to articulate your thinking because otherwise, how do you share your ideas with the world? This could be through a painting or through a 60 second reel or TikTok that you put out there. Because whoever is able to do this and the most effective communicators of the 21st century will be the most influential and with influence, you can do just about anything. Those are the three critical skills you need to have. Next question is, what service could you start offering by using Photoshop and AI as a creative? Well, that's a very specific question, Photoshop and AI as a creative. Okay. If you look at where people spend money, it'll give you a clue as to what the market wants right now. And if you if you accept that we're in the uh, information economy, a subset of that is the attention economy. So it used to be that whoever can deliver the information control and organize information will be the richest uh, companies and brands in the world. Google is rich for a reason because they have organized the world's information. And then now we're moving into a place where, okay, there's an abundance of information. Now, what are we going to do with that? So it turns out we're not as independent thinkers as we'd like to be, or we imagine ourselves to be, that we're more influenced by the people that we look up to and they curate the information for us. Somebody told me this before, that universities used to be the centers of knowledge, but the knowledge and the information that's out there is so abundantly available that if they want to say, we're going to charge you $30,000 a semester to go to the school, they're competing with free or next to free. So the universities are no longer the information centers. They're the curators of information. Because there's an abundance of information, they have to say, well, we've done the research for you. These are the articles. These are the videos. These are the books that you need to read if you want to become good at something. And what they're really doing is they're saying, we're going to read all of it. We're going to sell you your time back to you because you don't have the time to read all of them. You might not even know all of them. And therefore, I'm going to pay you so I don't have to read all of them. I can just read the right one. That is the influence or attention economy at work there. So the rest of us who aren't interested in going to universities are looking to people who have done their own research, who have who are going to basically sell us our time back to us and say, look, I've tested these products. This is one you want to buy. I've read these books. This is the one you want to read. I've tried these exercise programs. This is the one you want to participate in. And they're therefore capturing that attention and directing the information, the right information to the right groups of people. So this is the thing that you want to be able to do. So you can see that there are successful entrepreneurs. Like I, I like to reference Alex Hermosi, who goes on stage and tells how much he's spending per month on his social media team. So when I heard him last, I think he said he spent $40,000 a month. That's an eye-watering amount of money per month. And he said, look, you think that's crazy? My wife spends $40,000 a month and they're married. So it's like the two of them together spend $80,000 a month on social media marketing. 
And then I heard recently that he was on stage saying he spends now $120,000 a month. The number is just getting higher and higher. So he and his wife are practically spending a quarter million dollars a month in social media marketing. And you think, this is ridiculous. Why would anybody do this? So Alex releases a video and he says, okay, let's, let's take a look at something. Why I have no problem spending this amount of money and why you might not be looking at the right thing. I got... And he's saying this, I'm just making up some numbers, 10 million impressions or views, okay? And if you, if you said, if you look at what they pay per CPM at $20, so if he has 10 million uh, divided by 10,000 times $20, he's like, that's how much somebody would have had to pay for this media. And he did the math, and I, I forget what the number was, but it's a really stupid high number. So he's like, I can spend money buying ads, I could just create content. But when I create content, I'm in complete control of what it is I do. And if I get the same impressions, that is equivalent of me spending five times as much money in ads. So I will spend this money all day long. The reason why Alex can do this is because he has a business where he invests in other people. So he needs to raise his profile to attract better candidates so that he can invest more money in more people. He's making his money work for him. So when we say like, what should we do with our skill set? Look at where people are spending their money and how you can participate in this. So if you, if you do packaging design, if you do brochure design or web design, if the attention isn't there and people aren't valuing that the way that you would like to be valued, look at where they're spending money. They're spending money on social media marketing, on podcasts, on YouTube, on Instagram, on LinkedIn to create awareness and engagement. So if you have some Photoshop skills and you have some ability to generate things in AI, I think there's a wonderful place that you can live in to turn that talent towards helping people grow on their social media channels by designing more engaging content so that they get better reach and impressions and engagement. If you can do that, people will pay you thousands of dollars a month and you can sign them up as a retainer client. And for you, it'll be baby work. So you got to just take your skills and just bring them to a slightly different market and you have a whole new opportunity. And you're thinking to yourself, I know what you're thinking. How many Hermoses are there out there? Well, not a lot, but they're different authors, CEOs, and founders of companies that have realized the same thing that Alex has realized. Those that can capture, direct, and monetize the attention will be the future billionaires. They're willing to spend the money. They're happy to spend the money. In fact, if you just look at me, I'm not anywhere near Alex's level, but we have, how many editors do we have? We have three full-time editors, one on staff and two, uh, two uh, contractors who are working with us. I'm spending thousands of dollars a month with each one of these things. I have a social media person who helps me with my Instagram and LinkedIn content. I hired a content writer who's working with it every single month. So now I'm looking at the numbers. I'm getting up there. I think I'm spending probably more than $20,000 a month in the different things that I'm doing with social media easily. And... I'm on a tiny little scale of a spectrum compared to like what Alex is doing revenue wise. And yet it's important to me. And you know, the funny thing is one of the people that I consult or coach, he was telling me how much money he paid for someone to write his tweet tweets for him. He pays $3,000 a month or something close to that just so he doesn't have to go on Twitter and he doesn't even make that much money. And I asked him, like, shouldn't you do this yourself? He goes, no, I don't want to. My time is more valuable. I'd rather focus on writing courses, uh, reading books, and doing something, and I'm happy to do this. But growing on Twitter is critical to my business model. I'm like, I get it. Smart guy. Smart guy. Can you give us uh, a tip like for a designer that was looking to make some extra money right now using Photoshop and AI? What would be like... Uh, a business opportunity you see right now? If you got some Photoshop skills and you understand a little bit about how algorithms work, you can easily make extra money right now by going in and helping people who have YouTube channels optimize. Without creating any content, quote unquote, you can help them come up with better titles. And if you use ChatGPT and you ask it to watch the video and you scrape it and you ask it to generate title ideas for you that has the highest potential click-through rate and you as the human can pick through that, and then go through and provide this as a service to, to people who are actively trying to grow on YouTube to change their titles and their thumbnail. Now you can use Photoshop beta to generate uh, just about anything. So you can take a pretty boring headshot, and I've done this myself, 
take a headshot where I don't have a rest of body. You can extend the body. You can add arms. You can point. You can change expressions. You can change the clothes. You can change the background. And you can use those design skills that you have at getting people to stop, to pay attention, to investigate and pick something up. You can use that also for YouTube. And people are willing to pay thousands of dollars a month, every single month. And if you picked up three clients, you can make $100,000 a year easily. And if that's something that you want to do, I strongly encourage you to do this. How do I pivot my business to a new service offering? Why are you pivoting your business to a new service offering? Because you're seeing a trend in the market and uh, the, let's say I used to work in, you know, the newspaper and now that is a dying field and I, I want to start offering a new service to my clients. If you're finding that you're working with an industry that's dying, that's no longer starving, like traditional print media for magazines and newspaper, clearly the days are, are numbered. And if it's not over, it's about to be over in a, in a second or two. So you have really good design skills. You know how to lay things out. You know how to communicate things. You know how to create copy that's compelling and legible and interesting to look at. So when you want to offer more services, my suggestion to you is not to offer more services, but to find an industry with the exact same skill set that you offer needs you right now. I'll give you the example, okay? Here's the classic example. I used to teach. I taught for 15 years at private art schools, both at Art Center and at Otis College of Design. And when I was a teacher, I was paid, I think, $55 an hour, I think towards the end of my teaching career. Meaning for, for over a decade, the most I ever made was about 55 bucks an hour. I'm, I'm sure it's a little bit higher than that, but it's not much. And when you do the math, it's less than what I paid freelancers who worked for me. Because some freelancers, I paid eight nine $900 a day, which is $100 an hour and more. And so I was thinking, okay, nobody ever got rich teaching, especially as an assistant adjunct instructor. I couldn't even get the title professor because I didn't have the credentials, apparently. Kind of interesting how academia works. And so there it is. There's my maximum earning potential. So here's the funny thing. I take the same skill set that I have, the same lesson, the same personality, the same spunk, and I just go and record a video on YouTube. And I do so for a number of years. And it's not that many years into it that my earning potential went from zero dollars an hour to thousands of dollars an hour because I'm able to monetize my teaching through brand deals, through uh, YouTube ad revenue, through teaching and speaking opportunities. I'm teaching the exact same thing in the exact same style that I used to teach. But all I did was I changed the format and the delivery platform and it's a whole new world. So when you're thinking like, you know what, what I'm doing sucks and it's a dead end thing, you're going to then chase a trend. Like everybody's doing like generative art or everybody's doing copywriting or building websites using Webflow and you chase that. What's happening is you're chasing the tail and you're not leading, but you're entering into a field where you don't know that much about. So not only are you a newbie chasing the tail, you're the most inexperienced person doing it. I would encourage you not to chase different um, skills or services, but to think if I take the exact same skill set that I have and I apply it to like an industry that's one degree different, it can have a massive return on investment. So let me give you some numbers to think about. My first topography course, the first course I've ever produced, recorded, and published has now made over a million dollars in gross sales. And I only needed to record it one time. Take into consideration 15 years of teaching, the entire salary in which I made from teaching those 15 years, far distant number compared to the million dollars of teaching one course. And that course I recorded, I think, in about six weeks, four weeks initially, and then adding two weeks to add uh, addendums to it. So six weeks of teaching grossed a million dollars in revenue. 14 weeks of teaching over 15 years, three times a year, I don't know if I've even made a hundred grand. That's the difference. So when I tell you, if you're in a dead end place, don't add more services, switch the vertical. That's what I'm talking about. I hope I made that super concrete for you. 
If you want to equip yourself with the right community, training, and resources to take your business to the next level, I want to personally invite you to check out the Future Pro Group and our membership, specifically created for experienced business owners ready to scale. 